Hello everyone, this is Brady. Long, long time ago, I've done this animation and people have asked me for a breakdown. There are many ways that you can achieve this animation, including methods that can be used in geometry nodes. Today, however, we are going to talk about animation nodes, which I think is kind of easier to use, and specifically using an approach that cannot be done with geometry nodes so far. The demonstration used a method that won't be discussed in this tutorial, if you would like to study these methods and use that methods in geometry nodes, the file is provided for free in the Discord server, um, whose link can be found in the description. So let's start. So here we're in Blender, I want to firstly describe a, another method. This method is also different from the one that they used in the demonstration, and, but this method can be used in geometry nodes as well. The whole point, uh, if you would like to study, you can definitely replicate this node tree. Uh, just to know that this random transform node is within the preset library, which you can download from the description. The whole point uh, is basically this ma uh, mixed matrix node, uh, matrices node. In geometry nodes, you can find a similar node as the attributes mix node, and so on and so forth. Um, this setup, I don't want to really explain and dig too much detail. I probably will elaborate it more in the future. But the whole point is that if you, I have set, the whole point is that I have a state A of all these kind of objects, and I have a state B of all these kind of objects. And then by using this mixed matrices node, I'm actually con, um, turning objects or points uh, from state A to state B. So it looks kind of a complicated movement, but in reality, you're just using a single uh, parameter to control all these kind of movement. And definitely you can offset the time frame and many, many other things to make it very different and interesting. But, uh, and the only thing that you need to worry about is basically zero to one, because that's, that's what the factor is doing. So it looks kind of a complicated movement. There are million, uh, billions of points from here to there. There are many different locations, transform rotations being involved, but in reality, it's just uh, to you, what you need to really concern is just a zero to one. Once you set the state A and the state B. The disadvantage of this method, however, is if you try to add a state C, so for example, you would like to make all these kind of points go up and then go down, it's not impossible. But you need to involve uh, one additional factor, and then it makes things a little bit more complicated. So it's go originally you only need to consider zero to one, but now you need to consider something like point five, an, an additional state which makes it a little bit awkward. Another thing is if you try to add noise during this pass, so because now everything is so linear, this point just goes straight to its destination. That point goes straight to its destination. The animation was kind of very boring. If you would like to make it more interesting, you can, but it makes things a little bit complicated. In general, today I'm going to discuss a, an, a kind of weird method, but this method is kind of interesting and worth that. So let's just start. So here is a simple fresh Blender file, and I'm going to add a basic curve, and I'm going to rotate on X uh, about 90 degrees, so that's this um, curve part is towards up. Uh, basically, what we're, what we're trying to do is to ask the object to follow uh, this spline, these curvatures. So, which means this method has been, this method is very similar to the one that I used for our tornado animation. The only difference is, in the past, we did not have a preset to simplify the workflow, but nowadays we do have. So before we start to do something interesting, uh, I'm going I'm goes to the edit mode and simply just to move these splines so that it's uh, one end is pointing to the origin so that we can once we rotate this it's rotating based on the origin. Next thing is just to call a random transform node. I've discussed that in a particular tutorial and you can just get it free from the preset library. And once we have this, just a translation, we have all the sound points. I think this is too annoying, so let's decrease the scale of 3 view. And then I'm going to instance the spline on the top of these points. So let's take a replicate spline. 
matrices into transformation and select our Bezier. We do not see our replicated splines. So just for visualization purposes, I'm going to put a curve object output just to know that in reality you do not need to see that. But this is just for visualization. So now we can see all these kind of instance the splines one end attached to the points. Looks kind of very ugly. Uh, actually, it looks interesting, but this is obviously not what we want. I'm just going to uh, take the rotation to a smaller amount so that they are still kind of uh, doing kind of crazy things a little bit. Just kind of getting kind of idea. Um, yeah, I think this is it. There are several small tweaks that you can make. Is One thing is I want to, the splines shooting upwards more. So you can take the matrix offset the matrices and just uh, rotate more on Y axis. Another way you can potentially do is because we're instancing on the basic curve, so you can actually just uh, modeling the initial basic curve and try to make kind of curvature. And the direction of the flow is the opposite from what we want. So I'm just going to select this curve and rotate the 180 degree. And then let's look at our targets. Our target does not um, update itself immediately. So you just uh, reselect our basis lines and then it will functions normally. So now we have our curves like a shooting star stuff, <laughs> which is good. Before we put object on the spline, uh, we need to assign the points on these splines. So here what do we do is we're going to use a preset which is called a follow spline list. And you put the splines into spline and the matrices into viewers, you can see it looks like the same as we got initially. That's all these kind of points just set at the beginning of all these splines. But uh, by changing this parameter, so we can increase the width and the scale of the matrices. By changing the parameters, you can see all these kind of points just the flow of the splines. And you can decide whether these points will loop or not. Currently, I will just uh, keep that close. So this is the projectile that all these kind of points flow. And I think that's as the object that you're getting. Okay. Now all these kind of points start at the same, same time and they end at the destination at the same time. So there are several changes that you can make. One is the potential offset. So you do not, not necessary to open a lot, just a very minor, like 0.01 should be sufficient enough. Another change is the speed offset. So if you do not have the position offset, then the speed of the movement will be different. So you can see some of the points already reached the destination while the other points uh, does not because there is a speed difference between the from points to points. So by changing these two parameters, it's not necessarily get a lot of change. You can add a lot of variation. It's not necessarily very obvious, but you do get a variation which makes things a little bit more interesting. Now we have the points. Next step is just to instance the objects on the points. Um, as I've explained in the other tutorial, there are basically two methods and probably uh, essentially more methods of instancing. In this case, um, to simplify the workflow, we're actually going to use this object instancer. And we need to define the amount of instances. You can either link the list length to the place or you can directly to put the matrices into place. It will automatically get a list length for your instancer. And then you can select any kind of object. So let's create several objects like cube, sphere, Icosphere. Actually, Icosphere is too similar to Sphere, so let's use a cylinder and let's use a torus. And we're just going to select any kind of them. It does not really matter, but I think I will just uh, put all this kind of uh, object into a collection. So hit M, um, new collection, just call it object. Okay. And you can select any object of them, and then pick the object matrix output. Take the object in, matrices in, and then you have all this kind of object being instanced. Okay, they look too huge, so you can actually manage the base. 
Uh, another thing is that if you would like to get the variation of the size, you can increase the range. A little bit, it should be fine. Also, you can get the random rotations by changing this ruler. I think I'm going to change the name in the future version. But this is it. If you would like to get random whatever, and by changing this parameter, you are moving them. Okay. But uh, now everything is just the cubes. So how can I actually put more objects in? So the method is basically we're going to use the copy object data list. And you put the objects into, and then we need the source. So we take the collection info. We need to define the object, uh, the collection, which is object. And then we need to pick the object within. If you directly put all objects in, then you only have uh, several objects being instanced. The reason is this length. The length of all objects is only four, but uh, the previous length contains 38. So we need to actually put more objects in. So it's kind of very easy just to take the repeat list. And then you can set type into length and put the length into length. So now we have all objects uh, being get into. If you would like to have a more kind of random distribution, like uh, have a random CD in the selection. So you can take a um, random, get a random list element. And then you can put the list into list. And then again, the same, you put the length into amount. So now you can change the seed so that's different place, get a different objects, this kind of stuff. Here's the one thing I want you to realize is basically what we're doing is to instance the cube and then to use the other object to replace our original cubes. Uh, so let's take a, an example. If I have a bevel modifier on our cubes, it does not directly pass down to children. You have to enable this copy full object. So both the name and the modifier will be copied. But the objects still retain their shapes uh, with our functionality. This is cool. But the other issue is that since we're instancing the cube, their name just becomes a cube throughout. That's not a problem with issues because you probably do not really care about all this kind of name. But what's pro what becomes a problem is that all this kind of sphere and the torus also inherit the same uh, modifier. This is not a desired. So what if my mesh contains so let's take a cylinder as an example. Let's uh, take a sphere, and I'm going to use the decimate, and decimate the crush that a little, uh, a lot, make the crush to a very low poly uh, mesh. In such a kind of case, how can we solve this problem? Uh, there is a node which is copy, uh, which is called a copy object modifier. So the modifier is from our original mesh, like the cube, sphere, cylinder, and torus and then the target is our target. So now what happens is once you have done that, now you can see our sphere contains the correct decimate modifier, cube contains the correct bevel modifier, and the torus has no modifier, cylinder has no modifier. So this is the way to work with that. Additionally, uh, once we are in 2.93, uh, I will make a tutorial talking about how to link animation nodes to geometry nodes. So that's you can simplify all this kind of workflow with just uh, one preset and you link everything within geometry nodes. It will be done easier. So please wait for that tutorial. But uh, if you do not want to use geometry nodes, this is basically a workaround that you can fulfill what you need easily. This tutorial has been basically finished here. Um, but the, the only uh, the one additional thing I would like to discuss is now everything, even if we're, we can offset the position, offset the speed, but the path itself is kind of not interesting. Okay, So it's just uh, the object just deadly goes from beginning to the end. There is no noise in their movement. Okay, So there is many different ways that you can add noise and so on and so forth. But I'm going to use one method. Uh, basically, we are going to randomize everything in our most initial splines. So let's just uh, only look at our initial spline. So this is the basal curve. This this is also the path that we're having. Uh, I'm going to use a node which is called a turbulent spline from points. What it happens is you input a vector 
It will form a spline based on the vector it inputs, but also add some noise on top of that. But we need the points. So usually what you can do is to take the spline info. In this case, it does not really work because uh, we, the bezel splines that we're having only, be, only having two points. So you cannot really add a lot of noise on the top of that to make it turbulent. So here we are going to use another node which is called evaluate spline. Okay, and then you select the points. You can use the count or step, it does not really matter. The, the, the one thing I want to remind you is in this particular case, uh, for this node, it does not mean that more points better the noise. Okay, so you do not need a high count like 50. You, like get a five is enough, really enough. And uh, put that into vector list. And we need to generate the same amount of splines as the points that we have. So now we have all these kind of splines. I'm going to shift the right click to converge these two places and then link the splines into place. Okay. And then if we turn on these targets, we get these turbulent splines. Let's increase the radius to one so that it becomes this, it becomes thicker. So now we have this spline and we can see that. Okay. And you can see we have tons of billions different splines and they have different noise. And you can manipulate the data like uniform amplitude and so on and so forth. There's a lot of things that you can discuss with this node. Like if you turn the start at zero, then they all start from the single same points. So this, basically there is no noise at the start. Uh, or you can actually change the interpolation as well. So that's more noise at the, uh, faster it gets more noise. And uh, kind of you can test by yourself. One important thing, however, is that if you want to the start and the end both at zero. You can use the mirror interpolation. So now you, you only have noise in the middle, but the start and the point are basically fixed to each other. Just to know the start and the stop, this kind of simple thing you can try yourself. Basically kind of very simple. Now what we need to do is just to put our splines back to the points that we made at the most beginning. So here I think I'm just going to um, hide this replicated spline because we no longer need that. Uh, here what we do is I'm going to call a node which is called a transform spline. Okay. This node starting from 2.93 has been vectorized. So you can directly plug the spline list into the place and the matrices into place. Uh, this is kind of an improvement uh, in the newest animation nodes. In the past, you have to make a loop and uh, doing so on and so forth is kind of uh, difficult, but anyway. So once you made that, everything has been back and you can play around with all this kind of parameter to get what you want. And uh, basically this has been finished. So let's make some conclusion here. Uh, in this tutorial, basically we're using a spline as a pass. We randomize the spline and the instance in the object on the top of that, so that we get a very interesting pass. The advantage of this method is we can get really complicated uh, motion paths of everything. For example, you just uh, extrude this spline for several times and then to update this entire better spline. Then we get a very interesting pass. You can see the pass literally, so this is also an advantage. Otherwise, sometimes you add a noise, but you have no idea how it affects your object movement. So now you can see all this kind of motion paths, and you can know how object follow this path. So considering this kind of fact, it immediately reminds me a kind of missile trace. That a missile is just attacking the spaceship or aircraft, such kind of things. The disadvantage of this method, however, is that the execution time uh, so now it looks kind of okay, 73 milliseconds, but we are only instancing maybe 38 objects in total. So if you take the everything into 200, then you can see it becomes uh, 159, so, so on and so forth. So there are things, there are limitations. I'm not saying this is the perfect method, but I think this is really worth that because it really opens a lot of more possibilities when you are making a complicated path. Uh, which is kind of very interesting.
So it depends on what you actually do, because it really looks cool. If you're considering the objects, uh, I think the reason it has to go such a high count is because we're not only instancing the object, but we're also instancing the spine. Okay. And another thing is, uh, this is not a very complicated node tree. Uh, in the future, I'm going to talk about how to export the animation nodes data into geometry nodes. So geometry nodes is faster in instancing, so perhaps it can help, but I'm not, I'm not really sure actually. But uh, anyway, uh, half of the tree can be killed once we can export the data from animation nodes to geometry nodes. But uh, this is basically it. This is not a complicated node tree, and I think uh, the result is kind of cool. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.